So this is everything that happens uh, in the process of signing in with Twitter. So here's me initially clicking the sign in link, then I got redirected to this thing, and then I get redirected back to Slash. We see uh, the serializing data, actually, no, sorry, you were, you were sort of right, and I was sort of wrong. Um, so the first step in here is not a whole lot happens, it just sees that I'm trying to sign in and it redirects me to Twitter. You can see that it's skipping a step because there's no current user. And then it uh, redirects me to Twitter. That happens between here and here. So where this line is right here, I am at Twitter. I'm seeing that redirecting you back to 127 blah 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 page. I end up getting redirected back here. Uh, and so you probably don't see this in your browser because you're only on this page for like one gazillionth of a second, this page right here. Um, but you can see that Twitter redirects you back here with OAuth token in here and then this OAuth verifier thing. I'm not sure about OAuth verifier, but OAuth token, that is the token that you're going to use to get information from Twitter's API. That's what that token is. It's just sent back as a get parameter at the end of this URL right here. And then we can see some additional stuff going on in here. Uh, so here's my session ID for this particular instance of me looking at 127, blah, blah, blah. You can see there's a session hash too. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but I'm sent back here and then passport does some stuff. Uh, and then down here, Passport uses that OAuth token that Twitter sent me to get information about me from Twitter. So first, Passport has gotten my OAuth token. Now it's making an API request to Twitter to get my user information, my Twitter user information. If I do this again, you can see that there are a couple of pauses in this process. So when I sign in, it pauses first at redirecting to Twitter. And then it paused again at this using the OAuth tokens, this thing right here. That's because here it's making a post request, request excuse me, to Twitter. It's making a post request to Twitter's API to get my information. And post requests take a little bit of time. Getting something from a completely different website takes a little bit of time. That's why it paused here for just a second. But then the API sends back my uh, Twitter info and it gets serialized. So serialized means uh, Twitter is sending me back something that's already been sort of packaged up. The serialization process is Passport taking that data and associating it with my session variable. So serialization is called serialization because uh, it comes from serial, like serial number. A serial number is a unique ID, right? Like every MacBook has its own serial number. Every, I know in the military, every rifle has its own serial number. Everything has its own unique serial number. Uh, and every session has its own serial number as well, its own unique session ID. So this serialization process is the process of taking my data and saving it with that serial number. That's what's going on there. So now it's saved as a session variable and I can access it in every other request. So I get redirected to the main page, and then down here is deserializing. So deserializing is the opposite. It's taking that data from the session variable and being able to do stuff with it. It's looking through my app sessions for that piece of data relevant to me. Uh, and then it can make it available on the view. Yeah, Samir. Yep, the OS token is a session variable. Mm -hmm. Yep, saved as a session variable. So you can see there are a butt ton of steps here, and these all happen on every single request you make on my app. Like even just refreshing the page, I get all of this stuff on here. All of these things you're seeing here, these are all middleware. So middleware is usually what you see in your app wherever there is a app.use. App.use indicates middleware. I know you've already talked about middleware a bit, but just to reiterate, middleware is something that happens between every request and every response. So uh, I you know, request this page from my server, 
Then it runs a whole bunch of middleware, and then it sends the response. So middleware is called middleware because it comes in the middle between the request and the response. The request happens, the app runs a whole bunch of middleware, and then it sends the response. Middleware can do any number of different things. Uh, this middleware right here just prints out this line of dashes and then the URL that you just went to in the browser. That's all it does. Um, but it can do all sorts of other things as well. One other thing to note is that middleware happens in the order in which it's written in here. So if I do app.use function res next da, ba, da, ba, da, console dot log a b a and then I do the same thing. I put a b down here and then I put a c down here. And first off, I'm going to need some nexts. Plug it out line just one second. And now anytime I do anything over here, I should see A, B, C. So all these middlewares are happening in exactly the order I wrote them in here. The reason I need next in here is because middleware is sort of a chain of events. It goes from one to the next one to the next one. If I don't put a next in here, if I delete this one, and then I go back here and refresh my page, it's just gonna hang. You can see up here that it's just hanging. That's because Express hasn't been told to do anything after that, uh, after that particular piece of middleware completes. It needs to be told, hey, go on to the next piece of middleware. So this seems kind of dumb, having to put like all of this dot next stuff in here. Like, why, why even bother putting in next? Shouldn't it be sort of implied that you're going to go on to the next thing? The whole reason is that Express likes to be super bare bones and super explicit about stuff. Um, and so they really want you to say when you want to go to the next thing. Because sometimes you don't actually want to go to the next piece of middleware. Sometimes you want to, I don't know, you just want to send something right there. Or you want to do something else entirely. There are a couple of different things you could do in there. So they require you to be more explicit about it. Um, which is kind of a trade-off. It's kind of annoying, but it's also helpful because it gives you a whole bunch more control over your app. But yeah, so we got all this middleware in here. Uh, and so pretty much everything you see in here, all these different things happening, these are all of the different middlewares. Samir? Um, Oh, yeah, that's right. That's what, I was like, didn't you just ask me that? But it's because I asked you to ask me again. Yes. No. Yes. Users can have an infinite number of session variables. So they can have an infinite number of things in here. However, a user can only have one session. Each user is only going to have one session. But browsers are that good at telling like, who's actually using a session. So, for instance, if I go, okay, I know this one's going to work. If I go back to GitHub, I'm logged in. I'm not going to go back there because, you know, I'm logged in. But if I open up an incognito window in Chrome, so incognito windows are ones that store no cookies. They don't store any cookies. And so as soon as you close this window, all of your cookies are gone. If I go to GitHub right now, you can see I'm not logged in. That's because uh, I have no cookies on here, and cookies are how the browser associates sessions with a particular user. This has no cookies, so it can't have a session. Uh, and so, yeah, so this incognito window can't store any sessions or anything. You can't actually log in and stuff in the incognito windows, but your session ends as soon as you close the window. So, technically, yes, a user could have multiple sessions. If you have, like, a regular window and an incognito window open, those will both be a session. Then if you have if you're using Chrome and then you open Safari, that'll be a session. Firefox will have its own session. Each browser will have its own session. But each of those will be completely independent from each other. The server won't know that you're actually the same user. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, bring it on. I'll be so reliable. Um, I was at the or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, so this thing, like this hashing step? No, but yeah, the step might be the same system except for at one point that they log in. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, I'm not sure it's when you log in. Uh, I'm not sure I believe you. Session. Nope. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not seeing it. Oh, somewhere in here. Yeah. Gotcha. So, mm -hmm. I don't think I actually changed it, but let's take a look and see what happens here. All right, dump the dump. I am a Twitter. Oh, cool. That's in there. Uh, the only thing I can think of in here is the session hack. Thing right here, or where it talks about hashing the session. Is that what you're talking about? Well, so right there it says this, and right above it, that's kind of so right below it. Yeah, so it says the session ID is this thing, and then it says it's hashing it. And it says the session hash is something else. Right, then right below it, then the ID is the Setting passport's own session variables, is that what you're talking about? No, so right below it, down, 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 Oh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah. Oh, you know what? I didn't even notice that. Huh. That's interesting. Yeah, so I'm guessing that's because exactly what you said. That's because I logged in. I didn't even notice that before. Um, but one other thing that happens is that, so I actually kind of lied. It doesn't just translate directly from ABC123 in your cookies to ABC123 in the sessions. Actually, the session gets hashed. That's what this hashing thing is talking about here. Uh, that also involves this thing in your env.js, so where I have breakfast cereal. Uh, remember, hashing is the process of taking some kind of a code and converting it to a number and then doing some really complicated piece of math with it. Complicated in that it's easy to do one direction, but really hard to do another direction. So an example of that would be like, uh, so this is a really easy example. Nine squared is, well, I know it's 81. But if I do 81 and then if I do this, this is a lot harder to figure out than this is. I can probably multiply this in my head and get it. But if I didn't already know that nine is the square root of 81, that would be a lot more difficult for me to figure out. So imagine you have ABC123, let's just go with 123, and instead of doing it to the second power, you do it to the 438th power. So that's actually still pretty easy for a computer to figure out. It'll probably just take a couple of seconds to multiply that. But if you give the computer some big, horrible number, and then tell it to figure out the 438th root of that, that's going to take years, at the very least. So what we're doing here, uh, to add an additional layer of security, is that this actually gets hashed use, using some sort of a hashing algorithm. So here, multiplying something to the 438 power, that is kind of a crappy hashing algorithm. Uh, it uses something else in here. But uh, what you actually have in here is the hash of ABC123. And so what it actually does is it takes this, it hashes it, and then it checks for something matching that hash over here. The reason for that is because then if someone has, cookies aren't very secure. People can usually figure out your cookies pretty easily. And so if they have your cookies, unless they know your hashing algorithm, they're not going to be able to hijack your session. They're not going to be able to say like, oh, I know your session ID. So now I can be logged in as you and access everything in your account. Similarly, if they know your session ID, they can't figure out what your cookies are. You have to have all pieces of the puzzle in order to actually be this user. So it adds a lot of security. This secret thing right here, uh, a secret is something that uh, goes into this hacking algorithm. So like the secret here might be, like you could call 438, you could call that the secret. So it's part of the equation that just 
makes it more complicated. Uh, and so then this way, even if you know this and you know the hashing algorithm, unless you know the secret, you still can't figure it out. So there are lots of different checks in here to make sure you are who you say you are. Questions about that? Uh, yeah, you can you can set it right in here. Like I I just set it to breakfast cereal. So. Yeah, so that's something that's done under the hood by Passport. It manages all that hashing for you. If you look into dependencies for Passport, it actually uses, well, you can see a couple things. You can see this base64 URL thing in there. Uh, that's an encryption algorithm. And then if I go and look in Passport in here, I think, well, one of these, it has a whole bunch of node modules. I don't know where it is. But somewhere in there, it has this thing called bcrypt. And bcrypt is this thing that's used all the time uh, because it's a super secure hashing algorithm. And Rails uses it, Passport uses it, everyone uses bcrypt. And so it's not as cut and dried as like that to the 438th power. It would be you do that and then you do it again to the 438th power and then you multiply it by this thing and then it's like crazy complicated and virtually impossible to undo. Other questions about that? So yeah, all the security stuff is being done under the hood um, while you do everything. Uh, let's see. All right. I don't think we've taken a break yet. I am so sorry. Why don't we break now and come back at uh, 10 till 4? Sorry, guys. I just showed